Hello everybody, how are you doing today? My name is Adam B, and it gives me a great pleasure to teach you some very fundamental aspects of programming, and especially in Python. So, let's get right to it. So, what is programming exactly? Well, this course is intended to be an intro course for many students who have uh, limited or prior knowledge to programming. So let's say if you are somebody who has no idea what programming is, or has taken some very basic form of programming such as HTML, well, I'd say this course is perfect for you because it starts out with some of the simplest forms of uh, coding to do in Python, and then it basically prepares you for more advanced concepts in computer science and programming. So, programming basically is a mathematical concept. There is a misconception by many people that programming can be, oh, programming is so difficult, it's so challenging. Well, yes, it can be at times, but it's actually um, a very fun way of learning some, you can say, theoretical and complex ways to make it simple. So programming is basically math and code, but it just kind of simplifies things to a very basic level where everybody can understand. You'll, you'll get what I mean later on, but this is just like maybe the most general way I could define programming for you. And it is, it's not specific to one language, but there are m multiple languages in programming. So I'm sure you've basically heard of Python, of Java, of C++, so on, so on. There are a lot there. Um, it's like, for example, you know English, but there is American English and British English. So there's the slight difference between one language to the other. So at, once you start learning programming, it can actually op open many opportunities in the marketplace. So Many of you may think that it is a challenging thing to learn. Actually, no, it is something very fun and logical. So you don't need to be a super smart person, even though I'm sure you, you guys are all are, uh, very smart. But it's, it's something that requires just a lot of um, logical thinking. And, and I'm sure you're aware of this, that the future of the marketplace is basically uh, computing, especially in artificial intelligence and many doctors even. For example, those of you who want, who have interest in medicine, many doctors start using uh, coding and, and programming because they want to control some bio, biomechanical machines to perform surgeries. Or let's say if you were an accountant working in the stock market, you'd obviously need uh, coding because you want to update the system for uh, company stocks. So there, there are a lot of a lot of opportunities. It's endless. Just search online, you can see the possibilities of programming. So, I'm sure you're wondering how much do programmers make? Well, there's a difference between a computer scientist and a programmer. A programmer basically codes, a computer scientist codes but with mathematical concepts. So, if you are somebody who wants to uh, become a computer scientist, uh, let's say they make an average of between 50.8k and 131k. I'm talking about US dollars because this is basically um, statistical reports based in the United States. Uh, this is actually quite a lot because you get to make more than other fields. For example, mechanical engineering or aerospace engineering, civil engineers, they make probably somewhere between uh, 60 and lower. But programmers usually make, on an average, I'd say somewhere close to 100k per year. So they pay well. Companies appreciate the work of programmers. An average programmer in the United States, well, makes between 39.8 thousand and 98.4. That's also very good because a programmer, I wouldn't say it's less that it's a position less than the computer scientist, but a computer scientist does. Uh, more challenging concepts in in the um, technology technological job field. So this is this is just a very rough estimate, but basically you you guys coming here to learn coding, especially through Python, this is going to be phenomenal because it's going to open a lot of opportunities for you. So what are some popular programming languages? There's Python. Python is a very simple language because 
you don't have those um, squiggly braces if you've heard about them in Java. <laughs> Um, yeah, so Python automatically does it for you. It's it's very high level. By high level, I mean that it's something easy for people to understand. Um, there's Java. Java is a good step as well. If you've taken Java before, then Python should be easier for you. JavaScript is also another language that's kind of a simpler version to Java. There's C++ and C and C Sharp. These are all like advanced languages. Something that's you can say very popular, very old in the uh, programming uh, industry. And there are lots more. There are lots more. There are uh, languages to control machines. There are languages for electrical circuits. The list is endless. You can, can go continuous. But I'm talking about the most uh, popular uh, programming languages that are out there today. So I hope I can. I gave you a uh, a very general and detailed start and at least an understanding of what is programming exactly. So in, a, in my next video in this course, we are going to start digging into Python. So stay tuned. Thank you for watching. Hello everybody, and welcome back to the second lecture of my Python course. So in this course, we are going to uh, start digging into Python concepts, and I will start with data types. But before that, I just want to give a uh, general introduction to what Python is actually. Um, Python is a high-level programming language. So in computer science, high-level means something that is easily understood by human beings. And that is actually kind of difficult to follow by, by computers. Because everything that runs on a computer is done through ones and zeros. Um, if we were talking about Java or C++, that is considered low level because it's more complex and harder to code, which basically makes it harder for humans to follow up, but it's actually easier for a computer to understand. So programming is, is basically giving compu a computer instructions to um, fulfill, but it depends how fast or how efficient your computer will understand your code, depending on the language. So Python is simple because it is intended for beginners who you can say have no prior coding experience or have just finished uh, taking HTML. Now HTML is good, but it's not considered a programming language because with Python, after learning it, you can do multiple things. HTML is kind of limited in what you can actually do in computer science and computer science concepts. So data types. Data types are actually maybe one of the most important and fundamental features of Python. So just as, as we know the difference between uh, letters and numbers, basically Python has this system where it can categorize different, you can say, um, inputs into a computer. So there are multiple multiple data types on Python. I, I can I can spend maybe just three more lectures explaining each and every one of them. But I'm just going to go through the most commonly used and the most popular data types. And I mean, if you are very interested into Python, you can just search online and you can understand some more uh, data types. But these are basically going to be the ones that we're, we will use the most throughout this course. Um, so strings. Strings are words with letters. So if you see anything with a letter, that is considered a string. Now hold on for a second. There is one condition. A string has to be letters within quotation marks. So anything that doesn't has, have quotation marks is not considered a string. So a, str is basically short for string. An int is short for integer. It's basically whole numbers like 1, 2, 55, 100. A float is, is basically a number but with a decimal point. So for example, if I had 2.0, 2.0 is not 2. There's a difference because 2 is a, an int. It's a whole number. But 2.0 is a float. If I had 4.55, 7.88, they're all considered floats. A list is an array type list. So if you've ever heard of an array type list, it's basically a data type that can store other forms of data types. It's very similar to how you document a shopping 
shopping list because you have bullet points. So these each bullet point is considered like a data type that is stored within one paper, and that paper is the list. A tuple is anything with brackets. So that's that's basically what I could say about tuples, but we'll we'll explain more about them in detail in another uh, lecture. A dictionary is has basically squiggly braces and there's a type and a value so don't worry about that for now we will explain that as well in another course but uh, sorry in another lecture but just to give you a rough idea of what is a dictionary so I'm going to show you a platform and this is what I'm going to be using to basically code some examples for you um, it's called PyCharm and I like it because it's it basically catches your mistakes. It's very clean, very colorful, very user-friendly. I like the um, interface of PyCharm. And there are a lot of other platforms that you can use, like for example, Jupyter Notebook, uh, Idle, which is directly provided from the Python company. But I, I personally like PyCharm. I, I'm not going to, unfortunately, I'm not going to spend this video explaining how to install it because we, I, I'd like to spend this time ex explaining more about Python concepts, but I mean you can you can just go online and search how to install one and the necessary installations that are required for a Python program to work. It shouldn't be that difficult. I think you should be fine. Um, yeah, and let's get to it. So one of the simplest things about programming to start with is print. Print in Python basically prints out something on a screen, so it displays something. And it can print certain data types. So if I were to say hello, and hello here is a string because as you can see, there are the quotation marks. So let me run this program now. And I have two hellos because I have two print statements. I kept one just as a reference here and I, I wanted to actually code the other one to show you. Okay. Now, there is another function called type. So type is basically something that shows you the data type. So let's print out type. And as you can see, it says class string. So str because we know hello is a string. Now, let's say type of 3.0. Okay, let's print out that. That's a float, because as we discussed earlier, 3.0 is a float. There's something called setting and getting, but it's mostly used in Java coding, but I'd like to re relate that to Python. So it's not explicitly called setting and getting. Please do not get confused on that. But I'm just going to give you an, ex uh, an example. So. One very important thing on Python is something called a variable. So a variable is any term that you can set it to something else. So let me go back to uh, PyCharm and show you exactly what a variable is. So if I were to say statement, this is just any random word you can use, but it's better to choose words that make sense for other computer scientists to understand. So I can say statement equals to one, two, and three. I'm setting this as an integer because this is a whole number okay so going back to my example here let's say i were to set num to one two three okay and then if i were to set another variable to num let's call it another so another equals to num this is called aliasing because they are here's how it works in memory in your computer memory num is basically taking a memory space so when you're setting another thing another variable to num it's basically setting both of these to the same memory space in your computer but if you say num equals one two three and another equals to one two three that's different because even though they have the same number they have the same value num is not equal to another it's different in technical terms uh, in your computer. So here, statement equals to one, two, three. If I were to say um, hello, it's a silly thing, but please um, just don't follow my, my way of coding. <laughs> um, 
So hello equals statement. These two are the same because I'm setting hello equals to statement with both, which both have the same memory addresses. But if I were to cancel hello and say one, two, three, hello is different from statement because these one, two, threes here, they are not the same in memory. They are the same to humans, but not to a computer. So this is something actually very interesting. Mutable and immutable types. So remember, mutable, it's like when you are muting a TV, you are actually changing the audio. But if I were to, if you say something is immutable, that means you cannot mute it. I'm just giving an example for you, for it to stick in your head. So immutable means that, you, immutable means you cannot change. Mutable means you can change. Remember, this is a very, very important thing. So, Mutable and immutable mostly refers to mostly refer to data types. Um, so you can always alter a variable, but the type it holds cannot be changed. So looking back at our example of num, num equals to one two three, you can change the value of num, but that one two three is always going to be stored in your computer's memory. So you cannot change that memory of one two three. Tuples cannot be changed because it is a rule in Python. So there are some there are some very restrictive rules in Python. Uh, we'll talk about that more in, in other lectures. In our next course, uh, sorry, in our next lecture, we will talk about lists. And I think this is going to be very exciting because with lists, you can it's basically um, explaining half of Python, in my opinion. It's very important. All right, thank you for watching. Stay tuned. Hello everyone and welcome back to our third lecture in Python programming and I hope you're enjoying the course so far. This course was intended to basically give you uh, the baby steps to learning more advanced concepts in computer science but through Python. So please don't forget to leave your reviews that other students can know more about this course, how do you like it, uh, things to improve um, and I'd really appreciate that. So in this lecture, we're going to dive into lists and lists are very, very important in Python. So lists in Python are array based. Now, what do I mean by array based? It means that you can actually store data in a very organized manner in lists. So let's visualize this. Let's forget everything we know so far about lists. Let's say you were trying to build a wall. The foundation of a wall starts with bricks. So let's say you are placing a horizontal um, row of bricks, one after the other. Each brick represents a data, but then your wall is basically the list. So that's exactly how you can visualize a Python list. They are usually in the form of square brackets, and then whatever is in within the square brackets is basically the data that you want to be stored. And lists are mutable. And we said anything that's mutable means that you can change it. So lists can be altered. There's a very important um, concept of lists, which is list slicing. This is mostly used when you want to access specific elements of a list. So I'm going to start with a variable, which is LST. I'm going to set it equal to a list of ints, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then when I say list of square bracket two, this is basically giving an instruction to Python to return back to you whatever is at index two. So some, Python, some um, programming languages start at index one, but Python always starts at index zero. So your index zero is one, your index one is two, your index two is three, so on, so on. So when I say list of two, that means I have to go to index two. So zero, one, two, that value over there is three. The next uh, form of slicing is when you say three colon negative one. So when you use columns, for example, negative one in Python is always referring to the last element of the list. Don't forget that. So if I were to say three, two, negative one, because the column is specifying an your starting point and then your ending point. So I start at index three all the way to the last element, but it does not include the last element. So let's go to index three. So we count zero, one, two, three. It's going to be a four. 
What this is going to return is 4, 5, 6, and 7, but it does not include 8. That's a rule in Python. List slicing can have up to three parameters, and parameters are basically input instructions to give to your computer. So here I want to access index 1 to 5, but not including 5. The 2 is telling you how many steps you should count after every index. So let us visualize this. Let's go to index 1, which is going to be 2, and then you want it all the way to 5. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So it's basically going to be from 2 to 6. And then this 2 here basically is going to start at 2. And then you count 2 steps after 2, which takes you to the next element. So it's going to return back 2. You count 2 steps. So 1, 2. It will return back 4. Then you count again 2. So 1, 2. It doesn't return back 6 because 6 is at index 5. And then as we said, you were saying index 1 to 5, but not including 5. So, I mean, if you're confused, just um, repeat the uh, what I said just now and try to follow up. Okay? There are a lot more tactics you can find online for list slicing, but these are basically the three main um, types of slicing. And slicing can also be performed on strings because strings basically have a data of letters, you can say. So it's basically like um, how many letters or um, what part of a word that you want to access. So list slicing comes in handy. Before I get into nested lists, I want to do some practice of list slicing. So let's say I say array equals to um, 3, 5, 7, 9, 10. And then I want to print whatever my list slicing will return back. So I want to access the third item of the list, which is going to be at index 2. I'm not saying the third index. So let's print this. It's going to give you 7. But let's say I want to access, I want this list to give me, let's say from index 0 to the last index. But we're going to count two steps. This gives 3 and 7, because you count, start at 3, 1, 2, 7, 9, 10, doesn't include 10. Okay, so these are just some examples. A nested list is basically a list within a list. So in Python, you can have like multiple lists that are basically within an enclosed main list. So here I have 1, 2, and 7 as regular ints. But the data type here is a list because you have another list that is within the big list here. So you have a list that has 3, 4, and 5. So if I want to say list, get me the second, uh, the value at index 2, that gives you 3, 4, and 5 because at index 2, it's a list. But if I were to say uh, list at index 2 of index 0, that means we go to index 2. So we start 0, 1, 2, that's your index 2. And then give me the uh, value at the first, at the index 0 of that list. So it's going to be 3 because you are specifying uh, exactly what you want from that particular list. So let me do an example. So instead, let me cancel 9 and instead I'm going to do 1, 2, uh, another 3. So we have a list within a list within a list. And now I want to print array at index 0, 1, 2, 3. So let's print at index 3. As you can see, it's giving you this entire thing here. But let's say I want to access the uh, last element. As you can see here, it doesn't return back 3 because 3, this is a list here, it's not an int. But if I were to say at index 0, it's a 3 here because here's a trick. You have three lists, so you can basically have three indexes to, um, to get a very specific element. 
There's another thing about the list in Python that is very important, and it comes, <clears throat> it's basically the length function. So it's like you want to calculate how many elements there are in a list. It's not the indexes, it's the elements. So if I were to say print length of array, whoops, sorry. Let's have a look here. It's going to be a five. Why? Because we have one, two, three, this whole thing here is considered an element, so it's the fourth element, and then here's the fifth. We're not counting by indexes. There's a difference between an index, because when you're counting the number of elements, you start with one. But if you're counting by indexes, you are starting by zero. There are mutating methods for lists. There are two main methods. There is append and extend. So let's say if you wanted to add a number to the main list, use append. So if I had a list of 1, 2, and 3, and I wanted to add a 4, so I just say list.append, because append is a function. So your list is going to end up looking like 1, 2, 3, and 4. But extending is when you want to add two lists together. So actually, it's better if I show you examples. Here, let's say I wanted to add 100 to array. So I'm going to use append. 100. I'm going to print array. So our resulting list will look like that. You see the 100 has been added here. But let's say I also want to add another list after 100. So array.extend to 4. As you can see here, you have also two and four. But what happens if, instead of using extend, I use append here? I'm going to try and let you guess that. Have you guessed it? Let's have a look now. Oh, there's a big difference now. You have a list within the main list, because you are basically just adding instead of extending. Extending is adding two lists together, or in other words, you can say concatenating. But appending is just adding an element, whether whatever data type it is, to the list. So that's something um, you have to look out for in Python. There are other ways to mutate, mutate lists. So for example, you can change the value by accessing a certain index. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Let's say I wanted to set the value at the second index to 6. So I go to 1, 2, so I go to index 0, 1, 2, so the second index's value is 3. If I use this line, your list would be 1, 2, 6, 4, 5, because you actually mutated the list. There's also dot pop, which basically removes the last element. So if I were to call it on list.pop, it's going to remove 5, and your resulting list will be 1, 2, 3, and 4. You can say list.pop3, but that doesn't mean you are popping 3. You are popping the element at index 3. So you start at 0, 1, 2, 3. So you're going to remove 4. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to my next lecture, which is lecture number 4. I hope you're having a great time and learning new concepts about Python. And now we're going to talk about tuples, which is maybe one of the most interesting things about Python. So first of all, what are tuples? So tup a tuple is a different data type in Python, and you can automatically identify it through round brackets. That's maybe the only thing you need to know about tuples is that you just can notice a tuple from its round brackets. And tuples are immutable, meaning that you cannot really change them because it's a rule in Python. And I bet you're wondering why are tuples being used? Because you, maybe sometimes you want to store different da uh, data types or different data or information, and you don't want that information to be changed. So the ideal structure to use is a tuple because nobody else can change whatever's within it. But there is a way to access items in a tuple. It's exactly the same as lists. So let's say you had a tuple uh, 
2 and 4 and you set the variable top equal to 2 and 4. So if you want to access 2, all you have to do is just say top of index 0 because as we talked in the list, the first item is always at index 0. If you want the second item, the tuple, so you can just say top of 1. That's all you need to know. A tuple can be accessed, but you cannot change. Like, for example, let me show you in PyCharm something about tuples. So this was from our last lecture. Um, let's say top equals to 9 and 5. And then let's say I want to print top of 0. Let's see how... Yeah, so you will be getting a 9. Let's say I want to print the second item. That's going to give you a 5. But what happens when I say top at index 0 and I set it equals to 6? There's a type error here. It says a tuple does not support item assignment. In other words, it's saying that you cannot change whatever is within the tuple. So that's that's something that many new programmers can um, make mistakes on. So it's better, or in other words, I should say, never change whatever is within a tuple. If you want to access something from it, that's possible. So this lecture was very short because that's basically almost everything you need to know about tuples. And unless in our next lecture, we are going to talk about dictionaries. Um, stay tuned. Thank you for watching. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to our fourth lecture. And I hope you're getting a lot of information, becoming more knowledgeable in programming. And before I start in this lecture, I just want to um, give some advice to um, following students who are watching that you have to always practice. If you just watch these videos, but you're not practicing, it's not going to do any good because programming is exactly the same as math. The more you practice, the more you will improve. So this is just an advice to me that after watching these videos, um, I'd suggest going on Google and trying to find some problems. And that way it actually can increase your knowledge and then you find these concepts which you once thought were complex, now as simple. Okay? And the reason I'm saying this is because in this lecture, we're going to talk about dictionaries, and dictionaries, in my opinion, can be maybe one of the most complex um, topics for beginner programming. So let's get to it. I'm going to, I'll try my best to make it as simple as possible, don't worry. <laughs> so a dic every dictionary in Python has a key and a value. So let's forget about that for a minute, and imagine you're looking for the word aircraft in a dictionary. So the key of the dictionary is aircraft. You search through it and then suddenly you find the definition of aircraft. But what is the definition exactly? It's the value of your key. So you find aircraft and then it defines a flying object. That's exactly how Python dictionaries work because you have a key and a value. So for example, we have a variable dictionary, and I set it equal to a dictionary structure, where you have three different items, each with a key and a value. So for example, here, hello is your key, and the value of hello is two. Here you have check, its value is three. One is a key, its value is four. So this is basically the first step of understanding dictionaries. You can access a dictionary, and it's actually easy to do so. So, for example, you have the variable search, and then you have Mercury, Venus, and Earth, which are all um, keys, and they all they each have a value representing their uh, position in our solar system. So, if you want to get the keys of the dictionary or the items, you can just say search dot items. Dot items is basically a function that will give you the keys of the dictionary. If you want to access a value, for example, let's say you want to access the value of Venus. So you can just say search, since search is our variable, uh, square brackets. And this time we are not dealing with um, indexes. We are dealing with the 
keys. We're, we're dealing with what the key actually is. So if I say search of Venus, that will basically return to, because you are specifying the exact key that you want the um, value of. Dictionaries are immutable structures, meaning that you can actually change them. Because they act in a very similar manner to lists. The only difference between a dictionary and a list is that a list has just one, um, one data. Per, um, how can I say this? It's like a dictionary just contains a number of data. But here, a dictionary has a number of data, but each data has a key and a value. So, for example, if I want to change the value of hey, so you have hey and its value is 2, all I can do is just say look, since look is our variable here, of square brackets hey, I'm specifying what key I want to change its value of, and I can say equals to 5. So now, this 2 will be cancelled, and then you will have a 5 replaced. Let's look at another example where we have a nested dictionary, which is variable look2. So I have two keys, which are James and Air. But James' value is a dictionary. That's the thing. It's not, a, it's not like a number in our previous example of look. So let's say I want to change... I want to change the 2 of hello to 5. Now that can be actually tricky. All you have to do is just say look to of James, since you are basically accessing the first key of hello. And then you set it equal to 5. Why? Because you are accessing two keys simultaneously. You first access James, which basically gives you access to the entire dictionary of James. And then you access hello, which is a key within that nested dictionary. And that's basically it about dictionaries. There are a lot, a lot of things you can actually do with dictionaries. You can store... Um, dictionaries actually can be used um, for sports programming because you can um, try to calculate a team's uh, score, for example. And then you can compare that with another team. Um, I remember doing that for a programming uh, assignment. Um, you can do multiple things with dictionaries. They can come in very handy, especially if you have um, many different um, variables or data information that you want to keep track of. So I suggest try and do some practice. And our next lesson is going to be if, elif, else. But I just want you to feel com comfortable before going to that by doing some examples with dictionaries. So I have a variable tup, and it has two keys, which are e and r. e has value 1, r has value 4. So if I say print tup of e, that's basically going to access e, which should return back 1. So let's print it. Exactly. You see here? It returns back 1. But let's see, by the way, this is a comment. I'm going to go into comments in another lecture, but anything that has a hashtag means a comment, so it's basically useless for now. But let's say I remove this comment. When I say top of E equals to 2, look what's going to happen. When I print top of E, it's going to equal to 2 because I have updated the list. So you can just try playing around. Um, doing different things with dictionaries. You can tr try to even search for dictionary methods. And once you're confident, you can continue on if, elf, else. All right, stay tuned. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our next lecture. Um, I hope you've done enough practice for dictionaries in order to prepare you for this next Python concept. In my opinion, I'd say it's maybe one of the most important concepts in Python. And tr trust me, it's going to be easy, don't worry. It's going to be about if, elf, else. So if I ask you this question, what is if? Like, what does if mean? So basically, if is a condition. I'm going to give you an example. Let's say your parents tell you, if you get good grades, then I'm going to reward you. It's basically a condition that needs to be fulfilled in order for that result to happen. Um, that's exactly how Python works with if statements. So this is an example of an if code. 
So if I check for the type of hello, and then I see if it's e if it is a string, this equal equal sign here means that two values are the same. But if I use the word is instead of these equal equal signs, that is checking if their memory addresses are the same, which is obviously false. Um, and I, I bet some of you are asking asking right now. Um, why can we use just one equal sign? Well, one equal sign is only for assigning values. It is not used to check whether two things are the same. And an if condition, you can say executes to a type we haven't discussed earlier because I wanted to save it for this lecture, a Boolean type. Now, a Boolean type can be either true or false. And if it's true, that means the if condition executes. If it's false, that means it's not going to execute. So if our type of hello here was a string, then it would return thank you. But if our type wasn't a string, that means this whole thing is false and your thank you will not be returned. We have an elif statement. Elif follows an if statement. So let me just show something to you on Python. If elif else, elif can follow an if, and elif is always dependent on the if statement, because if the if statement is false, that means it is automatically going to go to elif. But if, maybe some of you are wondering, why can't we just keep it if and if? Well, you can do that as well but it's just they wouldn't be related to each other because this if is independent of the other if. Let's say if this was false, then this if is basically checking for another condition. So elif is always related and dependent to the first if. And then if you have two ifs, that means you want them to um, check separate situations, for example. Um, going back, let's talk a little more about elif. Now, elf is a shorter version of else if. That means if your first if statement is false, it's saying that, oh, maybe something else might be true. So it goes into elif. And you can have multiple elif statements. It's not only limited to one. Um, here's an example. If type of one is a string, it means the value of this function here is a string, return true. But we know that 1 is an integer, so this would be automatically false. Then it goes into the elif statement, because this was false. So elif type of 1 was an int. We know this is true, so you have to return true. Because the elif statement was dependent on if. If was false, goes into elif. If elif is true, so you return true. And remember, when you are coding if and elf statements, your condition should always be should always have a colon on the end. That means you are starting a new block of code. All right. Now, finally, we will talk about else. Else doesn't have a conditional statement. It is basically like you can say distinct from if and elf, but it's also dependent on the previous statements. Because it's saying, for example, your if has a condition, your elf has a condition. If all these conditions are not met, that means you have no option but to go to else, and else will execute no matter what exactly. So else will not execute if either of your elf conditions or your if conditions execute true. Else will only execute if none of your conditions are met. Let me repeat that. Probably you might be confused. Else always executes if none of your previous conditions execute true. So let me um, show you an example here. You have two variables which are top and top two. So top is one, two, three, top two is one, two, three, they're both the same. Now if top is top two, that means if they both have the same memory addresses, we talked about this, this is going to be false. So it's not going to return true. Elif top equals equals to top two. 
then it returns true. The ELF statement will execute to true because they both have the same values. But imagine if your top two is going to be one, two, and four, your ELF will execute to false as well. So that's where the else statement comes in. It will return false no matter what because your previous conditions have been executed to false. So let me um, do an example. And this time we are going to use um, new statements. So let me put in two variables, which is here equals to 932, and then L equals to um, 25, 25, 4, and 6. Okay. So my first if statement will check if the length of deer is equal to the length of L and oh this is something new we haven't talked about well I'm going to explain it in a bit and length of deer does not equal to zero when you have an exclamation point and you have an equal sign that's basically saying not so it's the opposite of it's the opposite of checking if they're equal. So it's saying not. Here's our keyword and. And is basically a, you can say, Boolean expression. So and executes true if two conditions are true. If one of them is false, that means your and condition is automatically going to be false. If both were false, it's going to be false. If both were true, that is the only time where and will be true which is different from OR because OR in Python checks if either one is true. If both are false, that's the only time where you have it as false. If one was true and the other was false, it's still going to be true. So remember, this is Boolean logic, which is very important in computer science, especially in circuit designs, which um, probably you might touch on later in other courses. So let's check AND. get this out of the way. So you print i elif length of l was 2 you print i there else you print wrong can this is basically, this is random by the way. Um, sorry, I'm just going to change these values. So let's start here. Hi there was printed. Why? Because our first if condition executed to false because their lengths are different. So the length of L was 2, so you print hi there. Let's change that to 6 now. It prints high because your first if condition executed to true because both have length 3 and deer, deer's length is not equal to 0. But let's change this a bit. Let me put this equal to 25 and let's see what's going to be printed. Wrong condition. Why? Well, because the lengths are different. Um, L's length is not equal to 2, so all of the conditions before the L statement have been executed to false, so you have no other option except printing wrong condition. That's how, that's maybe a general format of how if else else works. In our next lecture, we will be touching on for loops, so stay tuned. Thank you. Hello everyone, and welcome back to our Python uh, course. Uh, for this lecture, we're going to talk about for loops, and for loops are actually very enjoyable and very fun. So it's going to be the first in what we're going to learn in loops. So for is an iteration. In general, a loop is something that 
is a cycle, so it keeps on repeating over and over again. That's a loop. But a for loop is an iteration, meaning it goes through a finite number of elements. And for is mostly used in lists because you are going through each element of a list. It's used basically for a data type where you know when the loop is going to stop. So it's like you know how many um, elements a certain data type you're iterating through has, and you know when exactly it will stop. But the thing is, a for loop is useful when you want to probably mutate the list or you want to find out something within the list. So we'll actually do some um, examples right now. So let's say you want to add one to each element of a given list, which is one, two, three, four, five, and six. So you actually need to iterate through the whole list in order to add one to each element. So let's say our first condition is for item in list. Now, item is our keyword, and you can just call it anything. You can say for item, for thing, for object, it doesn't matter. It's a variable name. It's just a random variable name. So when I start, it's for item in list, and I can say item equals to item plus one. This condition here, or this statement, is very different from what you learn in mathematics because it's saying item, let's say your item was three. So you're saying three equals to three plus one. That's how you do it in math. But how can three equals to four? It's basically saying item, so that's your variable name. You are going to change that into its original value, which is three plus one, so it will be four. This item here does not equal to three. You are assigning four now to item instead of three. You can do it in a simpler way in Python where you can just say item plus equals to one. It is a copy paste thing of the same statement here. It is exactly the same. Before I touch on while loops, I want to do um, multiple examples with for loops. So <clears throat> let's say I have a list called Delta, where I have one, two, four, six, seven. And let's say I want to create a list with only odd numbers from our given list here. So I can say new list is equal to an empty list. I'm assigning an empty list to our variable new list. And then now all I have to do is just iterate through delta. So for item in delta, <clears throat> and then I can say if. Now here's here's a very interesting uh, part because you can use um, if statements within for loops. This is a very special um, thing in Python. So I can say if item percent two equals equals to one. I bet you're all saying, whoa, 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 what's going on? What's happening right now? When you say item percent two, that means what is your remainder after dividing by two? So any items remainder after dividing by two can be either a zero or a one. A zero means it is even, a one means that is, it is odd. This is a, some part of um, discrete mathematics and also part of calculus. So if you're saying if item percent two equals equals to one, that means if your item is basically an odd number. So I can say new list dot, should I use append or extend? Well, last time we talked about this, we said append is used for numbers, or just adding a, um, a data type that's simple. So dot append item. So I exit the for loop. I don't need to use an else statement because we still want our for loop to keep, keep on iterating. So I can just say print new list. Well, let's see what we will have. 1 and 7. Why? Because 1 and 7 are our only odd numbers in this list. 
It's pretty interesting, right? Hello everyone and welcome back to our Python course. For this lecture we will be talking about while loops. So a while loop is something like a clock and it's different from, from a for loop because it is basically kind of like a combination between a for loop and an if statement. So it's something where you don't know when your loop will stop. And it keeps on iterating until your condition is met. So let's do an example of a while loop. So you, let's say you want to return the length of an inputted list without using length. So you basically want to count the length of a list, but instead of using length, you're going to use a while loop. So our condition here is that if our list is not empty, so you're just going to keep on iterating through it, or just keep on continuing. So while list is not equal to an empty list, you keep on popping from the list, and then you add one, because you just want to shorten the length, and then you just want to keep on adding one. So your count will, in the end, be six, because you're just going to keep on popping. So I pop one, add one to count. Pop two, add one to count. Keep on go doing that until your list is empty. That's when your while loop will meet its condition. And then your count will be six. So our next lecture is going to look at functions, but I just want to do another demonstration with while loops. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So let's say um, I have a list called cargo. And then my condition is that if my list is not equal to an empty list, so just print hello. Sorry, cargo is not equal to an empty list. And I want you to try and think what's going to happen to it when I run it. And this is just going to go on forever and ever until basically my computer crashes. <laughs> but I just wanted to give you an idea of what's going on. I, I said the condition will stop in the while loop once it's met. But your cargo here is never empty. so. All it's doing is just going to print hello, 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 infinitely, and it's never going to stop. So that's basically a downside of while loops, because you can just keep on running infinitely, and then your program can end up crashing. Um, that's a lot of, that's basically a mistake a lot of programmers can do sometimes. So the most important thing about while loops is just always look at the condition that you are given, and that your condition should never result in an infinite thing. So that's just an example I wanted to give to you, and just try to do some practice on while loops, and I think you're good to go. Um, for our next lecture, we will talk about functions, so um, stay tuned. Hello everyone, and welcome back to our Python course. Um, in this lecture, we will talk about functions, and now I'd say after learning a lot of Python concepts from for loops to while loops to if else statements, now's the big chance where we actually dig into computer science aspects. And functions is basically the stepping stone of what you will learn in computer science. So let's start. In this image here, this is basically a combustion engine. It's basically what your car looks like from the inside. So imagine a function being that, where you have many statements, many code blocks, and it executes a specific um, action. So simply speaking, a function is a block of code that executes a specific action or gives a computer a specific instruction. So let's dive into what a function actually is technically. So a function has a header. 
Always in Python, when you want to define a function, use def. And this is a rule in Python. It's a syntax rule. Use def, which basically tells your Python program that, oh, I want to start a function right now. After def, you can use any name. It's similar to naming variables, but this time you're naming your function. After your function name, you have to use um, round brackets. And this isn't a tuple, by the way. This is just round brackets so that you can add um, the parameters within those brackets. And as I, as I said earlier, parameters are basically like inputs to um, give your program instructions. There's something called type annotation, and it's simply defining the parameter types. It's not necessary to do it in Python, but it gives other computer scientists at least an idea of how your um, function works. So let's say I have two parameters, which, which are ax and shoe. They're just random names. So ax is a string and shoe is a float. That's exactly what I'm doing. I use a colon to, def to define the type of ax. So this gives a chance to other, for other computer science scientists to understand what exactly are your parameters. And then lastly, you have the return type of the function. So you can say, is it a Boolean? Is it an integer or something else? This is an example of a function. So I start with the keyword def, def, and then my function name is add one. Add one is the name of the function. I keep a space between def and the name of the function because def is basically like an instruction. And then I use the open round brackets. And within that, you can see I have two parameters, which are list and val. List is of type list, and then val is of type integer. And then here, I use dash and arrow which is basically telling Python that, oh, look at this function, it's basically going to return a list. So you start the code by, by putting in a column. And what this function does is that you are adding one to each item of um, list. So I use a for loop because as I said in one of my earlier lectures that you want to actually iterate through your for loop. So for item in list, item plus equals to val. So your val can be one, or your val can be any other integer that is basically provided to the function header add one. So let's say if my val was a five, that means I'm going to keep on adding five to each and every element in my list. And then lastly, I return back my list. This is maybe a very, very simple skeletal form of a function in Python, but at least you'll get the idea of how it actually works. There are other type annotations for a function or a variable, and these are basically like advanced type annotations. So you have any. Any means that the function or a variable can have any return type. So it can be either an integer or a string or a float. It doesn't matter. It can be anything. You have union. So from the word union in math, it means it can have either one of two return types. So for example, if you had a union of int and float, that means that function or variable can either be an int or a float, but it can be nothing else. So it's limited to these two. You have optional. So it can be a specific type, like an integer or a float, but it, or it can be nothing at all. And that's where the keyword none in Python comes in. None in Python means it is nothing at all. So for example, if you had optional string, that means your function or variable can either be a string, but if it wasn't a string, then it should be an automatic none. It can be, cannot be something else. And then here's a complicated type annotation called variable. So it takes in two expressions. The first is a list of types. So it's used basically for a function's arguments. You can say the types of its parameters. And then the second is the function's return types. 
So it's mostly used for a parameter that is a function. So if I had callable int int as a first expression and then bool, that means my function takes in parameters, two parameters of type int, and then it should return back a boolean. These type annotations are not very commonly used in Python, but it gives you at least an idea of some very important computer science aspects. Before going on to our next lecture, I want to try and build a function with you. So let's start. As I said, you start with the keyword def. And then let's say I want to, uh, I don't know, multiply every item in a for loop with a value provided. So I can call my function multiply. And then my parameter is going to be val, sorry, um, list, which is of type list, and val, which is of type int. And then my return type should be a list as well. Oops, and I forgot the column because you want to start a new block of code. So you can say for item in list, item multiplied equal to val. And then you basically want to return back a list. Whoops. So this is like a very simple definition of a function. And then I have this block here. You don't need to mind it, but it's just like how I can call a function. So I can say print multiply of, let's say my list was one, two, and three, and I want to multiply each and every one of them by five. So let me just go through the straight. You have one, two, and three, which is basically list, and then you have val, which is five. And it makes sense to put in the type annotations because you know that this is a list and this is an int. And then here I'm printing multiply because multiply is going to return back a list. And that's basically how it should work. It prints one, two, and three which is actually incorrect because you were supposed to multiply 5 by 1, 2, and 3. But there is something wrong about this. I'm going to keep it to you because I want you to try and figure out. This is part of, um, this is part of uh, debugging, and debugging computer science is basically when you catch an error and you don't really know how you can solve it, so you just keep on testing and trying. So I'm going to keep it up to you. and. I'll see you in my next lecture, which is about doctrines and comments. Hello everybody and welcome back to our Python lecture. So this lecture will be kind of short, but it's actually going to be quite fun because we will be talking about doc strings and comments. So what exactly are doc strings? Well, doc strings are not really a Python thing. It's more of a design choice in computer science. So it's basically descriptions about your functions that allows other computer scientists who are looking at your code or who are editing your code to understand exactly what you are doing. Like, what is the purpose of your function? Why is it there? Why did you choose it to um, perform actions in a specific manner? So that's basically what a doc string does. So it's good design practice because it basically cleans up your code and polishes it. It's kind of like a report for your code. So doc strings always start with triple quotation marks and ends with triple quotation marks. And it's usually done um, after your function header. <clears throat> Comments are not exactly doc strings. Comments are extremely useful in not only Python, but in other programming languages as well, because you can type a line description in English of what specific thing is happening, or why did you decide to code something that specific. For example, why did you use an AND statement instead of a FOR statement? Why did you prefer to use a FOR loop instead of a WHILE loop? Um, why did you decide to use two functions instead of just combining them to one function? So these are 
I'm just giving very vague examples, but comments can actually help other programmers to follow your code easily because by the end of the day, we're coding and coding is not always easy to understand at first sight. So these comments can actually save a lot of time. And then when other people are looking at your code, they'll, they'll be like, oh, okay, now I understand why this guy's um, coding in this manner, for example. So comments always begin with a hashtag. So whenever you see a hashtag, that means it is a comment. Before we get to our next lecture, let me just provide an example of a dot string and a comment. So looking at a function example, let me type in dot string. So you can see here, I have three quotation marks and the three closing quotation marks. And I can say a function that multiplies each item of a list by three given value. And notice here that in my doc string example, I didn't provide an explanation for what my code does line by line because that is the worst mistake you can actually do when documenting doc strings. Because a doc string is just like a summary of what your function actually does, but the line by line thing is where your comments come in. So let me give an example of a comment. So I'm going to use, use a hashtag say iterating through given list and then I can use another comment where it says multiply item by given value okay and then I can say just return hashtag return the updated so this is an example of a function where you can use both a doc string and given and sorry comments. But remember, do not type too many comments because that can also be ugly and it can make your work look distracting. Because a programmer likes to know general things. Like for example, here in my for loop, you're iterating through a given list. That's actually kind of obvious. So I can just get rid of that. Do not type comments for things that are too obvious for other programmers to understand. Type comments for things that you've decided to code in a specific manner that other programmers may not understand at first because too many comments can just seem disruptive. Thank you so much and try practicing some previous lecture material that we've covered. But at the same time, I want you to get a hang of uh, writing comments while coding because this is actually very good design practice for programmers. All right, stay tuned. Thank you. And welcome to our last lecture, which will be about reading and writing to files. So this is considered in a way kind of an advanced Python concept, but it's basically letting you get a hands-on experience with real life applications and this time to um, your computer files. So let's get to it. Many people, or should I say programmers, find that reading from a file can be very useful. For example, let's take Google. Google, I'm sure, reads from a lot of websites and you can consider the websites as files. And then you know when you're searching for a keyword. So Google goes through all of the files that it has and then it kind of sorts it based on that keyword. And how does it do that? Because it reads content from those websites, which we, in our case, we consider it as files. The same thing here. When you are coding in Python, you sometimes want to find a specific thing in your computer files. So it's better to read from it. And here's general line of code to read from files. But before I get into that, there is a downside of reading from files, and that is sometimes you may forget to close those files after reading them, so they can take a lot of your computer resources without you, you, you noticing that. 
So as a result, at first your computer will be working fine, but in the long term, your computer is going to start slowing down. You'll experience some um, problems with your software. That's because a lot of resources are being eaten up by that file, which is still open. I mean, even if you shut down your computer, that file is still open. So here's the keyword with. With, what it does here is that it opens a file, but at the same time, once you're done using that file, it just closes it for you. Because, you know, we're human and we can sometimes forget that. So with open, open here is a function. So it's saying open a file file name. So this is a string. It doesn't necessarily have, have to be file name. It can be the name of the actual file you're searching for. In R. R here is a string that the computer understands that R means read. So remember, R is not just a regular string. It means read. So open the file by reading through it as words. So you are storing whatever is being read into this variable. It doesn't have to be words. It can be also something else. It's just catch a name or phrase to use. And after basically this line, you can do whatever you want with that file. So you can use um, slicing. You can search the words. You can try to sort these words. I mean, you can basically do multiple things with the file you are reading from. And it's basically your choice. You can search online for some practice exercises, but this is just a general format of how you read from a file. There are other ways you can open a read, but I prefer to use it with width because um, it closes the file for you, so I find that better to explain. There's a, another thing where you can actually write to a file. So it's a copy-paste of the previous line we saw, except that our string here, instead of R, it's W. So W means write. But there are two differences. W, our first difference is W, and then the second difference is that when you are writing to a file, basically all of your information in that file is lost. That means you are typing from scratch. So whatever thing you are adding to that file is basically new, and everything that was in this file just suddenly disappears. So that's a downside about Python. I am not 100% sure if you, there's a way to recover back that information, but you can try searching online. But to the best of my knowledge, as I understand, when you're writing to a file, it just all the information there disappears when you were just writing from the beginning. So these are the two most important um, things you can do with files. You can read from them and you can write to the files. And these are some advanced programming topics, but I'm just giving you a very um, general understanding of what we are. Right? Um, thank you so much for going through this course. This course was meant to be a fast learning course. It's not like the other courses where it will take a much, much longer time for you to understand Python. I tried to explain everything in detail, but in a very general way, so at least you can have it, an understanding to start programming smoothly. And the, the way I explain this course is to kind of give you those um, support wheels in a training bicycle for you to actually train on yourself by doing other exercises. And stay tuned for a, another course, the next course that might be coming soon which will talk about some computer science concepts instead of programming. So I hope you enjoyed the course. Please don't forget to put down reviews. And I hope you gained a lot of information from this. And the most important thing is please practice. Thank you so much, guys.